Well, thank you. It's nice to be here. I was very um, honored to be asked to come and speak today. Um, and I thank you um, all for coming and using the lunch hour to come and listen to this really unbelievably fabulous uh, project that we've been unfolding in the School of Nursing throughout the University of Pennsylvania. Um, you know, I, I just want to explain a little bit about how I got here. Um, I am a health services researcher. I use large data to study patient outcomes, particularly in hospitalized patients who have psychiatric conditions. Um, uh, because my, my main focus is that innovative model care, care models uh, for people who particularly with mental illness um, or comorbid mental illness, um, I started to look at the transitional care model to see if it worked for people with serious mental illness. So we did this study of people coming out of psychiatric hospitals here in Philadelphia. It was a random control trial. We looked to see if those in the intervention group had lower 30-day um, admission rates um, and some other um, the, outcomes such as links to community. We had a nurse that followed them, a psychiatric nurse practitioner from hospital, psychiatric hospitalization for 90 days. And what we found was that um, the intervention group actually uh, used services more. They had higher rates of 30-day readmission than the control group. And uh, the, the natural explanation for that is that this is a, um, a population that dies 25 years earlier than the general population, so they don't have uh, healthcare issues that are treatable. So, you know, naturally, if you put a nurse before somebody who's got little access to care, you're going to see higher rates of care. It's probably pretty normal. But what really came out of that study was a groundbreaking for me realization that there's no, the random control trials really can't answer the questions that we want to answer around systems and system changes. Um, when you do a random control trial, you control for all those environmental factors to the best you can. Um, mostly, you just forget that they're there and then make your inferences from your data. So I happened to invite on the team a, um, a systems engineer, Dr. Barry Silverman, who's a professor at Penn and has been working for the past 20 years with DARPA, um, uh, the Military Department of Defense on building simulations and using aging-based models um, for, to identify insurgents, for instance, in Afghanistan. It's, he's been using it around the world. And um, so I said to him, do you think that that modeling might, and that systems approach might be very effective in identifying issues that we've had with this population? He said, oh yes. And I said, oh boy. <laughs> And so that was the beginning of my journey. Simultaneously, um, my journey into technology, simultaneously, um, the year of the games came up as a theme at Penn, and I um, jumped in, and we started to take a look at um, how we could bring uh, together students from across the university, and we created what I call a spectacular transformative learning experience. In a time when there is a need for innovative solutions to healthcare challenges, educators have a responsibility to pre prepare a generation of students who can think outside the box. There is no riper body of students, although they're all over the place, but Penn has, you know, the elite of students. And I thought, why? You know, we need to bring, mix it up. And so um, the inaugural game solution for healthcare um, showcased this transformative learning experience, and we had students saying that they had never had such an incredible learning experience. And the mixing it up um, and the working together among the multidisciplines was just a fantastic experience. One uh, student said, who was an engineer, she said, I paid all this money for this education, and if I hadn't done this experience, I don't think I thought, would have thought it was worth it. Now, of course, that's an extreme response, but you kind of get the gist. And you know what I think it was? Is that um, these students in engineering, Wharton, and computer science are just simply hungry for the real world. And so we offer them the real world. We were the portal for them to come into um, projects. And we actually started a couple projects here um, at uh, CHOP, and I'll talk about those later. But this went on to um, 
build at the end of the year um, into prizes that we awarded people and everybody was very happy about that. So what happened was we, we came up with 15 interdisciplinary teams. We were just stunned with the, there was a total of 60 students and faculty that worked on these projects. Um, from, as you can see, from all, all, all of these various um, uh, areas at Penn. Um, and uh, you're not going to be able to read this, but it gives you a sense of what kinds of projects that were actually people came up with and that we did all those projects last year just as mind-blowing to me when I look at retrospect. But I'm going to be talking about some of these more specifically to give you a better idea of what exactly we actually did. So some of the, there were five strategies that we used. Um, consumer provider feedback. Um, these are projects that focus on communication systems between providers and patients. Recommender systems technology. This is just like Amazon. You know, you go on Amazon and um, all of a sudden pops up things of interest that you might, uh, might want to also buy. Simulation approach, using simulation technology to support decisions of providers or patients. Um, these tend to be system level approaches. That's the one I've just been describing to you. Risk diagnostic, the technology supports diagnostic decisions and alerts patients and providers to potential and actual risks. Uh, one of our projects was a um, head trauma project at a college um, in that the, within the 20, first 24 hours of a head injury was its critical time in setting up some kind of uh, a, a texting communication between the provider and um, and the patient was um, was the project. Education support is also a big part of what we did, um, and that came in the form of games, awards and points, and connecting to social networking. Um, so what we went from, actually, was the need to think differently about health. Um, we moved away from a focus on providing services to a single individual to measurably improving outcomes for the populations in our community. So this kind of work at the population level is um, something new and different that you probably you have been hearing about or reading about. So I'm going to tell you about this particular technology that developed that we called SUMO, uh, simulating urban mental health operations. And the purpose was to develop a decision support system that allowed public health administrators to simulate and visualize their mental health care systems interactive components to understand the cost and benefits of alternative scenarios. So we built a simulation of the behavioral health system in the city of Philadelphia. We had on board the director of behavioral health, uh, Arthur Evans. We had, the, we had the data that we needed. Um, actually, the data came from um, the National Comorbidity Study, um, and it also came from other uh, data from the city itself. Um, so we were studying people with serious mental illness. Um, they, are medic they are covered by Medicaid. Philadelphia spends approximately $850 million a year on these, this population. They were actually Medicaid, uh, the people provided with Medicaid are about 500,000 people in the city of Philadelphia. And just to give you a perspective, there are, there are approximately 1.5 million in the city. That, that says a lot about what, how big this problem is um, and how costly it is. So we wanted to know, um, can we sim uh, build a simulation game um, uh, to model the fractional <coughs> services this population gets, to assess the value of alternative interventions, and help users to improve services while reducing costs? So I'm not going to, uh, there's a lot of words, but I thought if you wanted to have a little more depth about what stimulation and particularly agent-based modeling is, this gives you some idea of what, that, uh, what that's about. And the agent-based modeling component, most of us know simulation now, SimCity kind of uh, applications. Um, but the agent-based modeling is a bit newer for uh, folks, particularly it's starting to get a hold in the decision-making process, uh, particularly at the systems level. So it uses artificial intelligence um, to detail agents, to simulate dynamic interrelationships of variables at multiple levels of analysis. There's these feedback processes, um, and you're, you're studying those feedback processes as a whole and over time. 
Um, it's built on game theory where virtual agents are created from live representations with a virtual context. That's the city of Philadelphia in this respect. The agents that we built were, the, that were representative of the population, those with serious mental illness, approximately 100,000 people. And it's literally, we built in 100,000 agents into our model. Uh, it's a big uh, operation, and it's quite um, fun to deal with. The resulting game simulation, we use the virtual agents to demonstrate conditions, conflicts, and challenges with causal inferences that can be acted upon allowing decision makers, anybody in the system, to test various hypotheses that reduce costs while maintaining or enhancing quality and outcomes. We are now doing a project at um, Huff looking at the population with congestive heart failure that are hospitalized and we're simulating the hospital environment and with agent-based modeling of the population with congestive heart failure to, to see if we can uh, lower the readmission rates. So these simulations with agent-based models allow policymakers to Consider and choose the most effective op option among competing strategies when resources for combating the problem are limited. And as everyone knows, um, Governor Corbett cut 20% of, of the budget uh, last year, the budget for Medicaid, and it, 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 it ended up being, it didn't actually go that deep and harsh, but there was a lot of angst about this because this population is in, um, the safety net is the Medicaid for them. This just gives you a sense of how the flow charts are built and how those how complex these flow charts are. Um, no need to linger on this other than to just get a sense of that. And the, pe the people or the agents, the actors in these um, agent-based environments um, have a theory of behavior that's actually um, uh, that drill down to human decisions, goals, and values. And that is, the, the theory we use is called the theory of reasons action. And there are other theories of behavior too. What's interesting to me about this, and I won't dwell on it because I can't have enough time, but um, I am a psychiatric nurse and I study um, uh, the serious mental illness in particular. I'm interested in those people that have schizophrenia or psychosis and have negative symptoms. In other words, there, there's a lot of amotivation um, associated with their um, how they operate in the world, and um, there's another theory that has to do with how the brain uh, learns in these kinds of um, impaired brains. Uh, the, the person learns how to avoid um, positive and or reward and um, and seek out. Um, any kind of negative behavior. So they're used, they learn to get used to the negative uh, responses and stimuli in their environment, and they lose touch with the reward system. And as a result, they, you know, all of us need some kind of pleasure in our lives. And so this may explain why there's such high levels of substance abuse in that population, because they have, they're seeking out ways to find um, uh, pleasure. Um, so, but in this theory, what you get are it accounts with internal and external factors, um, and it provides a decision-making process that an agent goes through, and this then informs the um, the modeling that happens. And if you look at this model here, please, I'm, you know, it's really complicated, but let me just see if I can make it simpler. Um, if you look up here, the the now, this actually is it, it's modeling of groups, institutions, agents, and token networks. I haven't talked about tokens yet, but I will in a minute. Um, and it's a reinforcing loop, so it, it assumes that if disease advances, quality of life gets worse, shortens, and further accelerates decline. And the player goal is to reverse this cycle of decline and try system ideas, save costs while reducing readmissions work toward the outcomes that we were looking at. What you have is you have various components of the system, the federal government, local government, a big component of the Medicaid population. And then we, we divided up the seriously mentally ill population into four quadrants. Um, quadrant one is, is a population, part of the population that really has mild 
mental health problems, mild medical problems, all the way up to quadrant four, which is people that have very serious medical, physical problems, as well as serious psychological problems. And so these actors get represented in this form here, um, as you can see, the well all the way up to the mentally and physically ill. And down here, what you do is you build the tokens that are associated are representative of the, the people, persons, and places that are in their lives. And um, this component here, there's a big component in this population around crime and drugs and uh, victimization. So we also, we didn't model that, but we want to put that into the model as we move forward with it. Oops. So just to give you a sense of this set, this model actually, we did the random control trial gave us no sense of um, any effect from a nurse going in for 90 days post hospitalization. This model told us that if you drop um, the number of days, the pa if you increase the number of days the patient stays in the hospital for a psychiatric hospitalization, you're going to drop the readmission rates. If you decrease the number of cases that the patient, that the nurse holds in her caseload, you're also going to drop the 30-day readmission. So in a sense, what you've got is um, you're, you have an emerging science, or you have an emerging opportunity to ask questions about what the phenomena of interest is for you in order to optimize the outcomes that you're looking for. Okay, so the other thing we did that, that was really powerful, um, and that, that was a very unique project that I just described with technology. Most of the projects that we worked with had to do with games. And we know games are fun. Um, I play games a lot. I like them, um, both board games and computer games. And from the data, it looks like you do too. <laughs> so, um, so we learn new things, and we learn to communicate in new ways. There's purpose, goal orientation, rule-based activity that the players perceive as fun, underscore perceive as fun. It's interactive, virtual, and voluntary, underscore voluntary, playing environment. And the struggle of the player against some kind of opposition exists. And there are rewards for play. So these are components of games. Now, if we think about our patients in relationship to these components, we can see that at least if, you know, most of us can accept that, um, that this may be a useful tool for us to use in the clinical settings to promote health behaviors or the behaviors we want that we know are going to get better outcomes. So gaming is widespread. There are 45 million homes have video game controllers. I'm not one of them, but um, I, I just play on my computer. <laughs> Over 154 million Americans play video games. That's about half of the country's population. Um, in a given week, the average eighth grade boy will play video games for about 23 hours, while the average girl will play about 12, and that's increasing. That's even more time than they spend watching TV. That's pretty phenomenal, isn't it? I mean, the, what's happening in the, the, the kids coming up is very interesting. Now, these games are big. Are, you can think of them as puzzles, are the central mechan mechanic of the game. It's ultimately puzzles are designed to help students embody the thinking, proce thinking processes, and habits of the mind of a scientist, mathematician, or engineer. Now, that's a very big statement, but as you look at what games do, if they are probing, they're sometimes random, they're sometimes focused. Observing one's environment in response to stimuli is to introduce repetitively. Um, forming hypotheses about where to go and the direction to take is happening ongoing. And testing and alerting um, single variables, in other words, alert, getting alerted by something and then targeting something is also common with the game. So here's one of the games that we came up with that actually grew uh, from one of your clinics, the asthma clinic here uh, for adolescents and for kids. And the team was um, a group of faculty from the School of Nursing, um, and the students were from nursing, engineering, um, design, uh, arts and sciences, um, and computer science. School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, actually computer sciences. And we worked with faculty also with computer science. Within about six weeks, this team from computer sciences, team of students, had built this game six weeks. It was unbelievable, the turnaround. 
They did the technology. We offered, we, we made sure that all the components were there on the game. So this whole, I'm not going to spend time on this, but you know, we all know that this is a real epidemic, the asthma that's happening among kids. Um, and we need to find ways to address this that is going to be more kid friendly. So we decided that we were going to build this game um, in, on a phone um, application so that we could have them, the patients download the application. It would be, of course, the parents' permission that that would happen. Um, and, and while they were waiting in the, in the waiting room, while they're in ERs, while they're with primary care doctors in general, and hopefully at some point, this might get so widespread that um, it could be used in, even in schools to teach. The game is about teaching the child to um, learn how to control their asthma using their inhalers and their other mechanisms. So these teams, they had planning sessions. Um, they met weekly. Um, the design team coded multiple versions, and they would come back, try them, and then they revise them. Um, they did a small informal survey of children assessing their predilection for phone games. Well, that they probably didn't have to do that. It is a given. They, um, they had advisor meetings for prototype review and questions, and they conducted research on existing um, Android games for asthma. In other, mean, in other words, they looked at the literature and the, and the Google to find out what exactly is out there. So they came up with this Android-based uh, phone application. The child um, moves through a city, cleaning up the dust, avoiding the asthma triggers which are chasing him. Points are gained um, as time elapses without trigger encounter. Energy level, which corresponds to asthma pathway in red, yellow, and green, will go down if trigger is encountered. Increase if inhaler or if nebulizer is taken. This follows the clinical rescue recommendations from the American Asthma Association. Educational messages throughout with fun sounds and action, and the game ends with a successful high, a high score, or it ends with the energy, uh, where the energy is depleted. If you look at these um, little components down here, these are the um, antigens, the agents that cause asthma. This is the figure of the little boy that um, runs through this. Okay, so that's one game that we did. Um, the other second game was a really creative uh, game called Body Wars. And the three people that designed this game were nursing students that were on a clinical, um, one of their clinical sites where they were learning about um, uh, community health care. So they built this game by, by, with Body Wars. And if you read this, I mean, you can't see it very well at the bottom, but it says a game for juvenile inmates in a detention center who are awaiting a hearing before juvenile court. The game is highly interactive, building player skill at identifying the body parts that is harmed from a substance or health problem such as HIV or STD. So this juvenile um, delinquent center here in Philadelphia is the population is growing, and what happens is they get into these into the detention center and they're completely isolated from each other. Of course, they're scared out of their minds and they're worried about getting hurt. Um, this game really pulled this group together and they started to play um, interactively. It was quite something. This is part of the problem. Of course, you know, we're all familiar with these issues with the adolescents, the STDs, um, uh, you know, the sexual activity, the exposure to drugs and alcohol is um, a problematic, but they don't really understand what the implications are for their behavior. So this game was targeting that. So they, uh, through this interactive game, um, they were encouraging uh, teams to learn um, and share with their peers, family, and friends. Understanding their anatomy encourages ownership over their bodies as promoting healthier behaviors and integration of anatomy with health knowledge is subsequent rounds of the game leads to empowerment. So what they did was they had the uh, kids lie down on these big sheets of paper, trace their bodies like this, and then what they would do is um, they, the teams go head to head again in a race to quickly place all organ pieces in the correct location of their body. First team to buzz in with the correct placement goes first. And then they race around um, the board game, each team rolling the dice to determine, and you can see this, these um, 
start here and finish here. They determine um, how many spaces they will move, which whatever spot the team lands on dictates the activity. A team will then select the corresponding card and will either have to answer a trivial question or complete a body challenge. Critical thinking and teamwork is a must. Other times, the team is at the mercy of a choices card that randomly punishes bad choices and rewards smart decisions. And believe me, that um, that was uh, a small component. So there are rewards and uh, other things. So the impact of this game, what happened with it? Well, these things actually tried in this Philadelphia Youth Study Center, 47 youths, 13 to 19 years old, both female and male. Um, they, the designers of the game went to the judge and said, we do this game, can we give these um, participants community service hours um, in, if they do this game? And they, they actually were successful in that, which is pretty amazing. Educators received exemplary feedback from staff at the study center who actively participated in the game with youth players, which is not common. There is a huge separation between the staff and the inmates. Positive feedback from youth stating how much fun they had and how much they learned. And one quote is, I believe that your game provides a non-threatening way to teach both adults and children how their bodies work and what activity and toxins can be detrimental to their health. The lesson, this lesson can be taught in a fun and competitive manner. Adolescents love competitive games. So we have another um, uh, project was called Find a Doc, and this is different. This was uh, oriented toward the problem that many of us experience in that we ask ourselves, we have to change our healthcare provider, um, or the healthcare providers changes our um, program, and um, we just don't have um, a sense of why, how we find the provider um, for the new insurance plan. So this game was about um, a search engine with filters for provider types, insurance plans, um, and accepting new patients and distances from where they were at that now. Um, they had used GPS technology to take the position of the individual and get them directions to where they needed to go. And they in incorporated a five-star rating system of provided by category with the option for comments. Um, the mobile application has a web site analog and healthcare consumers can search for providers and write reviews of providers either on their computer or their smartphone. So what they did was they used Kayak, Kayak Google Maps, and Yelp. Um, uh, Yelp is the public forum for rating and reviewing restaurants as a model, as a technology model to build into this application. And so step one, the application uses, uh, does a provider search using Kayak. Step two, Maps the GPS using Google Maps, and step three, um, it gives you directions. So this is what it looks like on your um, phone app, your smartphone. And you just um, plug in um, uh, to do a search. Um, it gives you maps. It does a profile of the provider. Um, it does any history that you have in relationship to this application, and you can contact for more information. Other uh, games were communication technology. Uh, this is a game we started a um, course this semester. This is one of the games that is being um, developed at this point by um, one of the uh, the physician, the physician director um, of the HIV Youth Clinic here at CHA. And it's going to provide some kind of wellness counseling for these youths that live with AIDS um, and HIV to improve their um, ad adherence to medication and um, lower their risk, uh, sexual risk. Um, and it will employ text messaging, reminders, visual depictions of behavior, and probably something along the lines of an avatar that they can work with and get familiar with. But the underlying point here is that this is going to increase communication between the provider and the kids, 
it, it grows the data that you have in order to make decisions about whether or not that person or that, that patient has been adhered to their medication reg regimen and what they need, and also gives you some kind of in, 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 indication about the risk factors. Another um, project that we worked on was, I've already talked about this one, was the head trauma improvement. Um, one that project that um, is now still in development from last year is called MamaQ. And it was a game focusing on helping teens breastfeed because while breastfeeding rates in the United States are low across all age groups, the lower rates are found within the lowest age groups. Our game it will invite tech savvy teens into a virtual world where they can learn the art of breastfeeding firsthand. Players will personalize virtual mamas and support persons vicariously experience pregnancy, birth, and breastfeeding. Learn to seek breastfeeding support and connect to an online community. They will learn to avoid breastfeeding problems by listening to their bodies and their babies. Now, this game got fairly well along in the, pro in the process, but as you can, if you, if you listen carefully, this is a very complicated game, and it needs a lot of components around the design and art and uh, technology because there are multiple frames that you have to do to build this kind of a game. So it's still in the process. Um, use of technology to improve outcomes in children with diabetes. This was a terrific team and actually won our first place prize last year of $1,500. Um, groups of students from engineering, um, actually uh, clinicians from your clinic, the diabetes clinic here, the adolescent diabetes clinic, from our faculty, um, Terry Lipman, and um, I think it's Kathy Montgomery from the clinic. It was just a phenomenal experience and I, th and, and I know that this game is is continuing to move along, but the point was to establish text message goal reminders for recently diagnosed type 1 diabetes patients aged 10 through 14. The tool aids in the adoption of diabetes-specific healthy habits by providing SMS reminders and eliciting progress responses by incentivizing patients with a point-based reward system. And, um, and then another uh, game, actually, was this Healthy Cities, Healthy Women simulation game. Um, and it was the purpose was to raise awareness around urban women's health issues and the cultural and social determinants that affect their health, such as safety, housing, education, and access to healthy foods and health care. More specifically, if you go in and play the game, what, you, what this game will do for you, it's an education tool for those community providers from any discipline who need the education and exposure to what it's like to be a, a woman in a, a single parent with kids in the community, the decisions they have to make using um, having only a, a low income, and, um, and what the game is that poses questions to the player. And by choosing the answers, the um, income drops, and you have to balance the income between some very very powerful ethical questions about should I go home from work and not earn my money and take my child to the doctors, um, or should I take um, should I go and buy purchase this food even though I know it's going to mean I can't take buy the medicine for my child. I mean those kinds of decisions get um, uh, the player gets exposed to that kind of decision making. It's a very interesting game. I wish I could show it to you, but again, it's in revised design right now um, because they want to move it from more of a, a 2D to a 3D uh, avatar-based game. So this is, a, this is one of my ideas that's never gotten yet to get played out, but I really thought that if we had an iPod application um, that could replace the nursing call system and allow patients access to ordering food, communicating comfort needs, communicating with their nurse or doctor, with an with incurring a large amount of provider time in cyber, without incurring a large amount of provider time in cyberspace, um, that the patient would feel more central to their care. They would have access to their labs, to their vital signs, um, basically to their chart. Um, this is certainly controversial in some regard, but there is a huge movement toward, thank goodness, um, a more patient-centralized decision-making process and awareness um, that would really shift the paradigm, I think, on a, a, with an inpatient experience. So, just to, to get some, um, to, you know, 
know, pull some closure and make sure we have time for questions because that always brings up some interesting things. Um, this is a course that I started offering here at um, Penn this fall, and um, it's offered to graduates and undergraduates, and um, we actually have one of our participants in the class right now, or here in the room. Um, but uh, the, anybody can apply for it. What happens is you come into the, the room, you usually have an idea. Most people do, some don't. Um, but then what I do is I contact the uh, engineer who are going through design and uh, computer science, uh, system science, there are all kinds of biotech, and um, they have a senior project that they must do. So I stand before them with some of the ideas that come forward and I invite them to join this class so that they then have a portal with, through nurses or physicians that are in the class or others from you know, the healthcare system in the area um, to walk into these um, clinical settings, the real world, so to speak, to play out some of these um, ideas and develop them. So what it means is it's very similar to what happened with the, my diatext from the uh, diabetes clinic. They just had a phenomenal experience where these um, engineer students came in and worked with them. Their ideas when they came in were nothing like the ideas when they came out. So it is an evolving process as they go. It's an emerging process. And um, we have, part of the team teaching this course is Barry Silverman, who's the professor of um, engineering, and um, his specialty is in age-based modeling and uh, system science, and Warren Longmire, who used to work here. He's not anymore, he worked in the um, autism center. And what we do is we work on these projects. Now, some of the projects that we're doing right now is the hospital simulation with agency-based modeling of the congestive heart failure patients. Um, we're also doing um, the HIV youth uh, uh, avatar counseling model, wellness counseling model. Um, we have another uh, student who wants to use, build an education tool to teach, to use a game format to teach nurses aides how to take care of dementia patients. And make it a fun experience, something they really they want to engage in. So, you know, in closing, I just want to show you the, um, the mega plan here. We've been having a lot of fun with this. Um, at School of Nursing, we um, do a lot of research. Um, a lot of our research is, has impact um, throughout the healthcare system and even the world. Um, and we've been pretty much in silos in education, where you know physicians get taught in one silo, nurses in another, warden in another, law in another, et cetera. And we are building a model, of an incubator model, where we see ourselves as being a portal or an incubator of innovative projects that use technology to solve access, quality, and cost problems. And we're, we're going to be using a social impact investing model of people, society, and profit. Social impact investing is a very different model than using a commercial or even uh, you know, developing an entrepreneurial arm that commercializes. We want to be able to measure the impact that our products make in the world. Measuring impact um, investing is on a, the edge of the, of the wave at this point. Even work is now shifting a lot more towards healthcare and looking at what kinds of business models we use there. So um, we want to unlock um, resources. We want to make it available to others. We want these engineering um, Wharton students to have a portal into the real world of healthcare. Um, from my experience, I get emails every week from these students that want to participate. I've also been engaged with the city of Philadelphia who has an innovation model um, design. They call it urban, urban mechanics, but they're looking for ways to reshape the way data the big data is being used in the city to promote healthy living. So we can portal to them as well as um, through this partnership group um, actually get students more engaged in these real world problems and solving them. So that's, um, that's the end of my message here. I wonder if you have any questions.